Hey guys, Tyler here. In Mass Effect 2, a handful of missions take place on the CD space station Omega. When you first visit the station, you find out that Omega's populace is being ravaged by a plague. This plague has killed dozens of members of various races, but has mysteriously spared humans, leading to intense suspicion surrounding its origins. In truth, the plague was bioengineered by the Collectors and distributed by the Vorcha, who allied with the Collectors to take over the station. And the player is tasked with reactivating environmental systems the Vorcha have disabled to deliver the cure. Realistically though, an alien virus like this would only affect sapient species from a single world and not species from completely different biospheres. Why is that? In this video, I'll explore the science of alien diseases how ME2's Omega Plague likely works, and what it reveals about the origin of life in their Milky Way galaxy. Let's get started. First things first, how diseases work in real life. The exact evolutionary origin of viruses, microscopic infection agents that only replicate inside living cells, is unclear, but it's believed that they likely emerged alongside, if not before, the first cells billions of years ago. And importantly, they have adapted to survive only in animal species that share the same basic biochemistry. In fact, it's incredibly rare for viral infections to cross animal species even if they have regular interactions. Bacteria, of course, are a different story. The bubonic plague, for instance, was transmitted via bites from infected fleas, which in turn often used rats as a vector to encounter human populations. Plague bacteria would form aggregates in the gut of infected fleas, which would regurgitate ingested blood into the bite site of a human or rodent host. The reason rats were so effective a vector is because of their similar blood chemistry to humans. Indeed, humans and rats share many biological attributes our most recent common ancestor with rodents having lived about 80 million years ago. Occasionally, novel viruses will make the jump from animal to human, as with several varieties of flu and coronavirus. Oh god, please don't demonetize this video, please don't demonetize this video. They even played a major role in our early evolution, triggering horizontal gene transfer and increasing genetic diversity in a manner similar to sexual reproduction. And it's generally accepted that mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, originated as invasive of bacteria. So microbes, both ones that harbor disease and ones that are more benign, have been with us for a long time and are a fundamental part of our biology. Okay, that's all good and well, but this all happened on one planet. Earth is currently the only planet known to harbor life in any way, shape, or form. We're not sure if aliens would look anything like us, even in any of the billions of Earth-like environments that might exist in our galaxy alone. Given the variety of surface gravities, temperatures, atmospheric pressures, and gas concentrations, and the randomness of natural selection, it's incredibly likely that aliens would be so radically different from our familiar understanding of life that we might not even recognize it as such. Visiting aliens would certainly have diseases that we are not immune to, which along with the fear that they would harm us for our resources, has led some scientists like Stephen Hawking to compare possible first contact with first contact between European colonizers and Native Americans. We all know how that story ends. I for one think the Trail of Tears was a bad thing. But just like others believe that most aliens would be peaceful, so too do many believe that the chances of alien diseases wiping us out are incredibly slim. Once again, anything that evolved in a different biosphere has a high likelihood of being so incompatible with our biology that our bodies don't even register alien pathogens as being, well, anything. But again, of course, humans are immune 
to the Omega Plague, yet it does affect other alien species on the station besides Vorcha. Curious. Indeed, now might be a good time to talk about the biology of the Vorcha themselves, who are quite unique and resilient. The Vorcha are a short-lived species, possessing an average lifespan of only 20 years. Their bodies consist of clusters of non-differentiated cells, much like those of the planarian worm on Earth. These cells grant the Vorcha limited regenerative abilities, as well as rapid adaptability, such as developing thicker skin after receiving burns, being able to breathe toxic gases, or increased musculature to withstand high gravity. Such specializations can heal an injured Vorcha in under a week. This trait makes the Vorcha immune to almost all known diseases, and it has also caused them to stop evolving in the traditional sense, their equivalent of DNA remaining unchanged for millions of years. As for their environment, Vorcha hail from the planet Heshtok, which is less massive than Earth, yet highly volcanically active. It orbits the K-type star Kaisel at 75% the distance Earth orbits the Sun. Heshtok has a very thin atmosphere, but a high surface temperature, owing to its closeness to its parent star. As Vorch's short lifespans ensure few long-standing institutions survive, they have no centralized government or military, and thus, many Vorcha are employed as cannon fodder troops in gangs like the Blood Pack. Clearly, in Mass Effect, the other sapient alien species are at least somewhat reminiscent of Earth life. Most have humanoid body plans, and even though <laughs> God, <laughs> most have humanoid body plans, and even those that don't are still like jellyfish or like bugs. Okay, but what about the different biospheres? Well, most of the planets that the player visits in the series have breathable atmospheres. These facts paint a picture of life in Mass Effect's Milky Way as being intimately connected in a manner similar to life on our own planet. This fundamental truth about the galaxy also serves as a justification, in-universe, for the Asari's ability to interbreed with other species, and for the Quarian's environmental suits to protect their compromised immune systems. But how could all of this have come to be? Well, as it turns out, it might all be connected to a little-known fact in Mass Effect lore. According to associate art director Matt Rhodes, when designing the various alien species of the galaxy, he theorized that they could all share a common ancestor. Their evolution would have been the result of directed panspermia billions of years in the past, much like the ancient humanoids in Star Trek The Next Generation's The Chase. If you're not familiar with panspermia, basically, it's the idea that life exists exists throughout the universe and could be distributed by space dust, meteoroids, asteroids, comets, and planetoids, as well as spacecraft unintentionally contaminated by microorganisms. The hypothesis proposes that organisms like bacteria, complete with their own DNA, could be transported through space by comets, for example, to planets like Earth. Panspermia is a fringe theory that has little support among mainstream scientists, chiefly because it does not answer the question regarding the origin of life, merely placing it on another celestial body. It's also considered impossible to test experimentally. There is precedent for microscopic life forms being able to survive the effects of space, including extremophiles like tardigrades. These extremophiles could become trapped in debris that's ejected into space following collisions between planets and smaller solar system bodies that harbor life. In addition, pseudopanspermia, also called soft panspermia or molecular panspermia, is the more well-attested hypothesis that many prebiotic organic building blocks of life did indeed originate from space, becoming incorporated in stellar nebula from which planets condense and further continuously distributed to planetary surfaces after which life emerged. In Star Trek, the ancient humanoids spread their genetic code in the primordial oceans of Earth-like planets four and a half billion years ago, possibly using a method like the mycelial network. The mycelial network. Like Mycelial network! After this, evolution on said planets followed a predetermined genetic path 
towards a humanoid form. This is not really how evolution works, but it's a common trope used in other sci-fi properties like Prometheus. So this being the case for Mass Effect would not be too out of the ordinary. It would explain why so many alien species across different planets have similar enough biochemistries to be susceptible to the admittedly bioengineered Omega Plague. Indeed, this was the exact thought process that Rhodes and the Mass Effect art team had when designing the ruins on Ilos in Mass Effect 1. Originally intended to be the Protheans before their design was finalized, the statues of tendril-laden creatures on Ilos were retconned to be the Inosanon, a prior intelligent alien race on whom the Protheans based much of their technology. So all in all, that's how the Omega Plague in Mass Effect 2 reveals one of the franchise's biggest secrets. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss any future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. By becoming a patron, remember you get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron to member only only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal, as well as my social media and merch store, where you can get a shirt like this, designed by my good friend Phobia, are in the description too. And speaking of Phobia, big thanks to him for suggesting this video topic. That's all I have for this week. I should go.